Hi, and uh, I'll just start by saying thanks to Brainwave for giving me the opportunity to, to speak here. It's a, an honor and a pleasure. Um, so I'm a, a geneticist, uh, a population geneticist, to be more accurate, and what, what we try and do is really following on from Dr. Lynch's talk is identify genes that are important in particular human conditions. So mo most of my work and uh, the work that's sponsored by Brainwave here is, uh, is on the genetics of epilepsy. So really there's, there's two things we're, we're trying to, or two streams of work that we're focused on, and again, John um, introduced them very eloquently. We're first of all trying to find genes underlying predisposition to epilepsy. So are there genetic factors that might predispose individuals to developing the condition? So that might allow you to identify people who are at risk of developing epilepsy in later life. Uh, that in itself is of value, but also the, the beauty of the work is it gives you a window to the biology of the, of the condition. And, and John finished his talk by talking about the importance of education and understanding epilepsy. And that's really the value uh, of, of, or one of the key values of understanding the genetics of epilepsy is that it lets the DNA tell us what's important to the biology of epilepsy. And by learning that, it, it gives us the potential to have more information and more education for designing new drugs in the future that could improve the lives of people with epilepsy. So that's the first broad branch of the, of the research that we do. The second one is the, the term pharmacogenetics. So what that's trying to do is, instead of understanding how epilepsy develops, it's trying to identify genetic factors that predict how patients will respond to particular treatments. So again, the, the, the dream is that one day people will be able to, when, when they go to a doctor and be treated for epilepsy, that as John outlined, that hopefully you can integrate their genetic makeup into the, the treatment course that they receive. But again, this is a very difficult and challenging question, and it's going to be a, a long-term um, research aim. So just to, to start with the, with, with the beginning of genetics, really, it, th this type of work begins with an observation, a very simple observation that people who are more closely related to each other uh, will share uh, particular traits. Uh, and it was Gregor Mendel, again, as John outlined, in the mid-1800s, whose experiments on peas in Austria uh, led to the concept of a gene. And that is something that we inherit from the previous generation that seems to control particular features. So in Mendel's case, his work on peas showed that the shapes and the nature of the pea pod was being inherited in a very predictable fashion, but that same concept of something that we inherit passes on uh, to, to human populations as well. And then in the mid-60s, we had the Nobel Prize winning work of Watson and Crick uh, that gave us the first description of the material that contains uh, those, those units that Mendel was trying to describe. So Mendel told us something was out there that we were inheriting, and Watson and Crick gave us the structure of what that thing was. Um, and this is it, we'll all be familiar with that, the, the, the helical, the beautiful helical structure, but the, the key thing is contained within it, and that's the code. You'll see the, the letters there on the image on the right. There are chemicals, four different chemicals, uh, we call adenine, thionine, guanine, and cytosine, or just for simplicity, A, T, C, and G. And it's the order of those chemicals that determines the nature of a particular gene, and the gene in turn codes for a protein, and we're all built of many, many different proteins. So really you can think of DNA as being the cooking recipe for the end product that, that is us. Now, the DNA differs between individuals. In fact, if we went and sequenced our entire genome, which is something that can actually be done today for a relatively cheap cost, we'll find that we've got around three billion of these letters. So I used to think this was quite a large number until a certain bank in Ireland came out with something 10 times that size. So that would give you an idea. Three billion, it's a reasonable size, but uh, there is larger things. Um, and if we align our genomes, each one of these, these three billion, we sequence everyone in the room, we align them, we'll find that we each differ from another person at around three to three and a half million sites. So that's what we call genetic variation, variants that exist between us all. Uh, and this variation, uh, in part, explains the diversity that we see in human populations. So we've all heard about nature versus nurture, and there's already been discussions here of genes versus environment. Well, that variation, those three million differences that exist between any two individuals in terms of their, of their genetic code, 
explains, at least in part, the genetic component to the diversity that we see in human populations. So there's diversity within this room, diversity in Dublin, Ireland, Europe, and you can zoom out to get the full diversity of the global population. In that context, there's also differences in our susceptibility to particular diseases, and of course, epilepsy is the focus uh, of, of this conference, and also of how we respond to particular diseases. So you can see the challenge and the focus, the core of the work that we do, is first of all understanding those differences that exist at a, at a genetic level between people, in other words, characterizing those, those three million between all pairs of individuals, and then once we've characterized them, we go, right, which ones are important to particular traits? Which ones can describe perhaps your hair color or your eye color or your height or your weight? Of much more importance, which ones are important in the development of epilepsy? And then are any of them important in how we can treat epilepsy? Uh, this figure here is just to try and illustrate that point again. So we've taken a small part of the code. In this case, it's around, say, 20 different letters. And we've sequenced it for five different people. And we've aligned it, say, if we were aligning like a, a surname Smith with a Y or an I, and you'll see every now and then, and it's highlighted in pink, there's a spelling change, right? So th that's the, the variation that I was talking about. There's around uh, three to three and a half million of those differences between any two individuals. So those are the things we try and identify. And once we have identified them, we go, right, maybe the first one, the T, the pink T, is that one important in epilepsy? So it's actually quite a simple concept in that we, we take... Uh, a cohort of, of patients who suffer epilepsy, then we take a cohort of individuals who don't suffer epilepsy, and we very simply look to see, do you see that spelling change more often in one group than the other? And if you do, it means that something associated with that change could be um, important in the development of epilepsy. And then going back to that window idea, if that particular T lies in a gene uh, with a particular biological function, knowing that it's involved in epilepsy tells you that that biological pathway is key to epilepsy, and that then opens the door to more work to hopefully developing treatments along that line. Uh, so this, this basic concept uh, has been explored extensively over the last three to four years, and it's, it's relatively new research because we simply didn't have the capacity to identify those differences between any two individuals. So Watson and Crick had given us the, the chemical structure of DNA in the 50s, but it really it wasn't until about 10 to 15 years ago that we were able to, to sequence even small sections of DNA, and it wasn't until the last probably two or three years that we could actually sequence entire genomes at a reasonably uh, cheap price. So this picture of a machine at the bottom uh, is something that can, within a week, will give you the full three billion bases uh, for an individual. Uh, it's not cheap. It still costs probably in the region of, of 10,000 euro to sequence a genome. But considering that even just two years ago, that cost was probably around 10 million, it gives you an idea how, of how fast the, the price is dropping to generate these massive um, amounts of, of information. Now, having the information is one thing. Understanding what it means is a, is a completely uh, a different question. And that's really where a lot of the work is focused at the moment. But they're applying this concept to uh, many, many different diseases and human traits. So different research groups around the world, and there's a lot of money going into, a lot of resources and, and money going into this area, are applying this concept of, of identifying genetic variation and trying to understand what's, it important, what's its importance to particular diseases. So this has been applied to many different conditions. It's still very much in its infancy, simply because it's still quite expensive, and not many people have been, have been sequenced or, or characterized in this, in this way for these different conditions. But we have started to do it uh, with epilepsy. Um, and I suppose the, the two key take-home messages at this point in the research, and again, I stress it's an early day, uh, it's, it's early in the day for the work, but uh, the first one is that if you've got a strong, or if the condition has a strong family history, for example, cystic fibrosis, John outlined how it's, it's quite predictable in its mode of inheritance, and indeed there are some forms of epilepsy with a, with a predictable mode of inheritance. If a condition has a strong family history, it's much, much easier to find the gene. On the other hand, if it's a complex condition, for example, something like uh, hypertension or you know, some forms of asthma, uh, and, importantly, most forms of epilepsy, 
uh, then it's much more challenging and we, meet, we need many more participants in the studies to be able to give us the power uh, to be able to detect quite subtle uh, genetic effects. And I think there was a question from the floor earlier on about you know, the interaction between genes and environments and how complex a question it's going to be. And I thought that was a very good one because it illustrates the requirement to have very large studies to give us the power to be able to disentangle what's a, a very complex question. And why would you want to do this? What, what's the motivation if the effects are, are quite small? Well, the, the, the simple motivation is that it's, it's the point of it's letting the DNA tell you what's important in the biology of the condition. And that opens up completely new avenues uh, for, for treatments. Um, <clears throat> the, the research community has responded to this challenge of complexity uh, by uh, kind of organizing itself into, into collaborations. So these are, are four large collaborative uh, research groups. Here in Ireland, we're involved with one called Epigen, which has uh, a center in London, in Belgium, and in the States. There's another large European effort called Epicure, which is mainly between Germany uh, and France. There's a large American effort called the Epilepsy Genome Phenome Project, and there's about 30 different centers across the states working in that. And, and John alluded to Professor Berkovich from uh, Melbourne in Australia, who's done uh, an incredible amount of work over the last um, 10 to 15 years on, on epilepsy and epilepsy genetics. Um, and I suppose the good news again is that um, these groups over the last six months have started to work together. So there's a big effort globally to try and get all the different research groups communicating, pooling resources, and working together to try and accelerate the, the progress of, uh, of the research. Uh, so what has the community learned uh, from epilepsy genetics so far? <coughs> well, first of all, we've identified around 20 genes uh, that we know are involved in the development of epilepsy, and we call these Mendelian genes because they predict epilepsies that have a very, very clear so-called Mendelian form of inheritance. So this relates to the autosomal dominant and, and recessive uh, nature of inheritance. So around 1% or perhaps under 1% of epilepsy show that very clear familial um, form of inheritance. And these are the ones that are most amenable to genetic mapping. And we've had relatively good success in identifying genes in those large families. So we've identified about 20 of these genes, and this has been important because it's, it's told us something critical about the biology of epilepsy. And if you remember Dr. Lynch's slide where he showed the, the membrane of a cell and those different channels that were controlling the, the flow of electrical current uh, across the membrane. So most of these 20 genes fall in that particular family, so it's given us the concept of epilepsies as a channelopathy, a disease of, of, of channels. Uh, and it's no coincidence that a lot of the drugs that are used to treat epilepsy today are focused on controlling the activity of those particular channels. The, the second important discovery that's been made, which is one that's happened over the last 12 months, is that large and rare deletions can cause around 1% of cases with epilepsies. So what do I mean by deletions? This is again, if we think we've sequenced our three billion bases and we've aligned it, or we've aligned all those, those genomes for individuals in the room, we'll see those single letter changes, around three million between any pair of individuals. But sometimes we also see chunks of DNA missing in their entirety, or you could have two copies of a particular gene. Uh, so we call these large insertions or deletions. We all carry them, we all probably carry about 100 of these chunks we've either got two copies of or sometimes they're deleted or absent in our DNA. If the chunk lies over a key part of the genome that's involved uh, or that's critical to epilepsy, it can cause that condition. And what's really interesting about uh, these, these deletions is that sometimes the same event can cause epilepsy in one person, uh, schizophrenia in another individual, and bipolar disease in, in another person. So it's it's showing the biological connections uh, between these conditions that really weren't thought to exist or not to that extent previously. Uh, the third thing we've learned is really uh, a challenge, uh, or it's the challenge that sporadic epilepsies, and by sporadic I mean those without a family history, those which just seem to, 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 to crop up in a, in a, in a particular family, th these are genetically complex. And again, Dr. Lynch 
um, um, spoke about this briefly, but we know there's a genetic component in at least a subsection of these uh, forms of epilepsy, but we also can see from the studies to date that genetically there's many, many different contributions uh, going into it, and those genetic factors are also probably interacting with the environment, which gives us uh, that complex question to disentangle. And the way we have to face that challenge is to have larger and larger studies with more individuals participating so that we have the, the power within the study to, to start disentangling uh, these issues. The fourth progress has been, uh, or the fourth point of, of progress has been in understanding how genetics can predict adverse reactions. So just to kind of outline this concept, uh, if you take a particular uh, anti-epileptic drug, say carbamazepin or tegretol, and you give it to a clinical population reasonably matched for, say, seizure type, so you think this is the appropriate drug for this population, uh, what you'll tend to find is uh, a group of individuals, hopefully a large proportion uh, of, of the patients who respond very well and get seizure control on, on, the, on this treatment, you'll get hopefully a smaller proportion who'll have a uh, a partial response, so it's improving the, the frequency and nature of the seizures, but it's not controlling them fully. You'll then get, hopefully, a, a smaller group again who will not respond at all, so then clinicians typically have to consider uh, a second form of treatment. And then you'll get a group that will have a severe adverse reaction to the condition. So in the case of carbamazepine, there's a mild reaction that can be in, form, in the form of a skin rash but sometimes this can progress to what's a life-threatening uh, condition of Stevens-Johnson syndrome. And one of the success stories of, of genetics in, relating to, in relation to adverse reactions to date is that we now have a test that has almost 100% accuracy for predicting uh, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, but the qualifier here is that the test only works in Asian descent uh, populations. Um, this is a, a test now that's FDA approved and it, uh, it is in use in, in clinics, um, or at least in, in some clinics, I should say. Uh, it, the, the reason why it only works in Asian descent populations is because the particular genetic factor that, that we need to test is only actually present in Asian descent populations. Now, the same adverse reaction exists in populations in Ireland, and we're working at the moment to try and identify the particular genetic um, factor, but we've, we've yet to find it even though we think we're, we're on the right route. I can say that we seem to have found something that's predicting the onset of just the mild rash in, uh, in Irish populations with, uh, who are exposed to, to carbamazepine. Um, the study that Brainwave are supporting in particular <laughs> is, is related to this in that 70% uh, of, of people with epilepsy approximately uh, will respond very well and achieve a good degree of seizure control with the first appropriate anti-epileptic drug. Uh, the, other th the remaining 30% uh, who don't respond uh, sometimes respond to a second treatment, but often uh, they have what we term chronic refractory epilepsy, which is very, very difficult to treat, uh, and, uh, and sometimes surgery, is, or surgery or VNS are the only um, uh, treatment options. So there's a, there's a requirement there to try and understand what's happening biologically within the refractory group. In other words, are there particular pathways that could be targeted with new treatments that might help uh, move some of those individuals from the difficult to treat refractory side into the well-controlled uh, seizure-free group? Um, and for example, one, one good drug that's worked in that sense is uh, Keppra or Levetiracetam. Uh, where some patients who had previously been um, difficult to control in that they'd had, you know, they'd been on three or four different medications and they still weren't responding, suddenly when they take Keppra, they were having complete seizure control. So is there something about that particular drug that's targeting a, a different biological pathway that's allowing seizure control? So we're, we're running a study now looking at, you know, those genetic uh, factors between the very e well-responding group and those other patients with difficult-to-control epilepsy to see can we highlight particular pathways that might one day offer uh, uh, new targets for, for treatment. Uh, we're also studying uh, large Irish families with a, with a strong history of epilepsy, and this goes back to the point that if you take a condition or forms of epilepsy 
that show a very clear pattern of inheritance, then it's easier in theory to, to find the underlying gene. So this is just uh, a picture of a, of, of a pedigree where the circles, it's like a, a genealogy or a family tree. So the circles represent females and the squares uh, represent males. And if you've got a, a filled dark circle, it means the individual experiences seizures. So what we do here is uh, we have basically markers across the entire genome and we look to see is a particular chunk of DNA always inherited with uh, the, the condition within the family tree. And if it is, well then we know something in the region of that marker is causing the seizures and then we can sequence through that region and hopefully find the, the underlying genetic factors. So this is uh, an area that we're very actively researching at the moment. Um, we, we need your help to do this work uh, without the participation uh, of people with epilepsy and their families. It's impossible for us to, to progress uh, our knowledge of the genetics of epilepsy. Um, we'd like to one day be in a position to, uh, to be able to inform and invite everyone in the country with seizures into our studies. Unfortunately, we don't have the, the resources to do that. Uh, so at the moment, recruitment from our for our studies is limited to two centers, uh, one at Beaumont Hospital, so these are Norman Delante's clinics, and also at St. James's Hospital uh, through Colin Doherty's uh, clinics. So it could well be that actually some of you in this room are already participating in these studies. Um, we are also uh, very interested in talking uh, with people who have a strong family history of the condition. We have the resources to, to recruit uh, we're trying to prioritize how we can recruit outside of these two hospitals and we thought a, a good place to start is for, for families who are, who are interested in engaging with this work who have a strong uh, family history of the condition. So if you've got say two or more siblings, brothers or sisters or if there's a parent with, uh, with, with epilepsy uh, as well as, as yourself or other siblings in the family we'd be certainly very interested in, uh, in, in telling you more about the work. Uh, we've also got a third study <laughs> Uh, where uh, we, we are keen to, to get people involved, and that is for people with temporal lobe epilepsy. Um, we have a study going where we're uh, looking at MRI scans and trying to, in patients with temporal lobe epilepsy and also their siblings, trying to understand are there specific uh, changes in brain morphology uh, that are unique to epilepsy or sometimes shared by an unaffected uh, sibling. So if you're interested in participating or even just learning more of these studies, uh, I absolutely invite you to come and, and speak with us. Uh, you can either speak with me today or I've got a contact number here or an email address or just ask at, uh, at Norman or Collins Clinics uh, that you know, you're interested in learning more about the work. Okay, so I'll just finish by acknowledging uh, Brainwave in particular for their, for their help in funding this work. Uh, also Science Foundation Ireland, uh, the Health Research Board. Colin and Norman have been fundamental in starting uh, these genetic studies in Ireland. Uh, Mary Fitzsimons with the electronic patient record at, at uh, Beaumont Hospital has also been extremely important and indeed the, the Beaumont Hospital epilepsy team and critically those of you who are participating in these studies we, we thank you and we hope that one day it, it can make a difference to, to people with epilepsy. So I'll finish there. <laughs>